This is Candidate Conversations. I'm Nick Gibson, a local government reporter for the Spokesman Review, and I'm here today to speak with Spokane County Commissioner Al French, a Republican candidate for the county's 5th District. Al, welcome. Good morning. How are you? I'm doing well. Thanks for being here today. Oh, love it. Thank you. Uh, why don't we start with your pitch to the voters? Uh, why should they cast their vote for you this November? Well, the voters know me. I mean, I've I've obviously been in office for a little bit, and and uh, have uh, worked hard to uh, uh, meet the needs of the community, and and I'm prepared to do that for another four years. And and there's a lot of uh, uh, opportunities for us to be able to uh, improve uh, not only uh, uh, the quality of life, but also our public safety and a variety of other things. And with my experience, uh, I'm in a, the best position to be able to make that happen. And so uh, it's been a real honor to serve the community, and I'm real humbled by the votes that uh, uh, have come my way over the years. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I obviously won the primary by a pretty good margin. And so, um, but we, we just continue to work to try and meet the needs of the community. And as, as long as the voters uh, will uh, uh, continue to trust my leadership, I will continue to provide it. Now, you've said this is your, your last bid for public office. What do you see as uh, the top issues facing the county right now that make you want to come back and serve another term? Well, I think with my experience and stuff, I'm in the best position to be able to, to lead the effort to uh, uh, get a new um, uh, jail facility uh, uh, constructed and, you know, through the, through the ballot process and and, uh, you know, this is uh, the criminal justice system is a real uh, intricate process. And uh, it takes a while to understand the roles that all of the different players play. And then how do we uh, package a unit to where uh, the voters will support it? And uh, we can actually uh, take this antiquated facility that's been in place since 1984 and grossly undersized and functionally obsolete. and. Uh, uh, provide a facility that will uh, be sized to where it will handle the uh, folks that want to do people harm and, uh, and a process that will uh, provide uh, uh, equal justice quicker. I want to stick with public safety there. Um, uh, you mentioned the jail measure that the county ran last year. One of the critiques was that it was kind of rushed and uh, it didn't have as much information as voters would have liked to see, what do you think could be changed that would make that uh, more successful if you do run another measure? Well, I, I fully expect that we probably will run another measure next year. Uh, and uh, we'll take a little bit more time to educate the community about uh, um, the different elements of the criminal justice system and the jail itself. Um, but, you know, the, the unfortunate thing is that the uh, the impression, especially from the city of Spokane, was that um, it was not detailed enough. Well, what we heard after the election was the voters had confidence in what the county was putting forward, but none of the cities said, well, of our 40 percent, we're going to do X. And whether they were going to invest it into criminal justice or more police officers and law enforcement or whatever they were going to do, that none of the city said, we are going to spend the money that comes to us in this manner. And that's what we hear folks objected to. They did not want to give city councils that kind of money without knowing how it was going to be spent. And, you know, I, I totally understand that. And uh, unfortunately, we can't control what the cities do. Uh, but hopefully uh, there'll be enough energy around it this time to where the cities will say, yes, and the 40 percent we're going to get, we're going to spend it on better law enforcement or uh, more neighborhood patrols or uh, whatever that city uh, deems is uh, best to meet the safety of their citizens. So hopefully that will uh, round out the rest of the package. But, uh, yeah, no, we'll, we'll, we'll be much more engaged uh, with the community. We'll start earlier and. Hopefully by the time we get to the ballot, people will feel comfortable enough with it to where they will approve it. We can uh, improve the quality of public safety in the community. Kind of sticking with uh, public safety, and thank you for your perspective there. Yeah. Um, there's some other stressors on the system that we've reported on. Uh, you know, the prosecutors have advocated for, for pay raises. They say they're not compensated fairly compared to other counties. Uh, public defenders are going to have new caseloads soon. 
uh, and then the red light status, which is kind of the capacity warning at the uh, the facility that we do have downtown. Um, it went off several times this summer. What, what else could be done to kind of address some of those stressors that are on the on the system? Well, the um, well, let me first start out by saying that every one of those folks that are part of the criminal justice system have endorsed my race. Um, from the prosecuting attorneys uh, to the uh, clerk uh, to uh, the sheriffs, both uh, Sheriff Knowles and Sheriff Knezovich have endorsed my race, and uh, the Sheriff Deputies Association, uh, which represents the, the men and women out there on the front line uh, every day, every night, uh, protecting our community and stuff. They've all endorsed my race and stuff. They feel that I'm the best one to be able to get us through this process. Uh, and, and with regard to the prosecuting attorneys, we have given them a pay raise. Uh, we've uh, gone from a 37 and a half hour week to a 40 hour week, and then we increased their pay above that. That's a dynamic that's uh, statewide. Um, uh, we are uh, um, in short supply of um, attorneys, either on the public defense side or the prosecution side. and. Um, uh, it's, it's a dynamic that we'll work our way through. Uh, and fortunately, we've got a public uh, or a um, prosecuting attorney that understands uh, that this is not unique to Spokane. And we'll work in a collaborative fashion to be able to uh, come up with a solution that allows him to be staffed at the level that he wants to be staffed at, to be able to deal with uh, the cases that uh, he's uh, challenged with and uh, still you know, respect and give full value to the taxpayers. I mean, I, that's the, the taxpayers and the burden on the taxpayers is one of my big concerns. I haven't increased property taxes for the last couple of years. I pledge not to increase property taxes next year. We've been fortunate enough to live off of um, the revenue that we get from new development. A strong economy uh, is driving revenue for the county and stuff. So. Uh, that gives us property tax relief for our citizens. And right now, you know, they're not getting any help from the state or the feds. They'll get it from me because I am sensitive to the fact that a lot of home um, budgets are really challenged right now, whether it's uh, inflation or taxes uh, from school districts and fire districts and all the other special purpose districts. Uh, but, you know, again, I haven't increased property tax the last couple of years and I don't plan on doing it next year. Well, thank you. I um, Before we get into some of those issues in the district specifically, I want to kind of stick with some of these countywide things um, and, and touch on housing. Uh, here at the paper, we've heard from uh, local business leaders and some residents that, you know, have a lot of uh, angst and, and disappointment with how local governments have responded to homelessness in the area. Uh, and I'm curious, if reelected, what you could do to kind of improve the response at the county level. Well, the county has done a number of things already. You know, we um, we were one of the first uh, counties in the state to create the um, uh, uh, crisis stabilization facility. And uh, what that facility does is when a law enforcement officer encounters somebody on the street that is either suffering from mental illness or uh, a drug addiction and, and uh, in crisis, instead of taking them to the jail uh, where you know, it's one very expensive to uh, provide that kind of treatment and uh, uh, the jail is not the right, right place. Uh, we've created this stabilization facility where they can get therapeutic treatment. They can uh, see uh, 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 people in the medical community that can provide the medication to help them get stabilized. And uh, uh, then once they're stabilized, they're back out on the street. Uh, but they they don't get a, um, a um, arrest record. Uh, we ne they never get into the criminal justice system. Uh, if they're suffering from a crisis, they haven't committed a crime, they're experiencing a crisis. And, uh, you know, before I got on the Board of County Commissioners, it, it was not uh, unusual to see uh, folks that were suffering from mental health that were in the jail. They didn't do anything wrong. They were just suffering from mental health issue. Uh, now we have the ability to stabilize them. We also do uh, ride-alongs, therapeutic ride-alongs with uh, our law enforcement officers where there is actually a therapist in the uh, patrol car so that if you encounter somebody on the street that's going through crisis, uh, instead of relying on a sheriff deputy that uh, is maybe not fully trained on how to deal with that kind of a situation, we've got a therapist there that can provide that, that kind of uh, 
uh, guidance and, and uh, immediate response. There is an opportunity for the county to play a bigger role with regard to homelessness and, and how do we um, uh, provide facilities that are across the county. It has to be done in more of a regional approach instead of uh, uh, having one jurisdiction kind of uh, impose that onto the rest of the county. And that's the big role that uh, I want to make sure that we do is that it's, a, it's not only a collaborative process, but it's a process that uh, will hold people accountable for their actions uh, and people that want to uh, change their life, that we provide the resources to be able to change their life and uh, assist them to get stabilized. Uh, right now, that is not happening. And um, you know, if the county is going to play a role, uh, we have to be in a position to where we're holding people accountable. And there, we have to also make sure that we're protecting our communities. You know, the, whether it's a small community like Medical Lake that you know, um, uh, had the uh, mayor of Spokane uh, looking at Pine Lodge as a potential uh, homeless shelter, uh, that, that, that should have started with a call to the mayor and that should have been a more collaborative process. Um, but uh, it wasn't, it was uh, um, uh, similar to what West Hills uh, neighborhood experienced where they didn't realize it was happening until it was way too late. You know, the, it's interesting that uh, our current mayor, um, when she was Secretary of Commerce, they produced a report, it's still on the website, that talks about how to lo locate behavioral health facilities in communities that don't want them. And uh, they recommend two different strategies. One is collaboration, but they say that collaboration is the most difficult to achieve. Um, and uh, uh, the other one is anonymity. And this is right in the report under her leadership. And anonymity says we're going to go in, we're going to do the deal and not make it public until it's way too late to stop it. Well, that's not the way we want to do things here at Spokane. And uh, while I understand that that was a report done under her leadership, um, it's, it's clearly not the way to, to, to deal with both our neighborhoods or our uh, small cities. And you think that collaborative approach uh, is tenable, even though it is, as they say, more difficult? I think it's, I think it's tenable. I think um, uh, the first thing we have to do is be able to create a level of trust. And right now that trust doesn't exist, um, uh, partly because of past actions, but also uh, there's real fear that, uh, and it's not just uh, in the small cities, but even uh, that fear exists in the city of Spokane when they have out, they passed Prop 1 by a 75% margin. I mean, clearly people are afraid that in the homeless community, there are people that engage in bad activity. And whether it's uh, uh, robbery, whether it's drugs, whether it's uh, sexual abuse, um, and the citizens said overwhelmingly, we don't want those people next to our kids. I don't blame them. I wouldn't want them next to my kids either. Uh, so the city has to demonstrate that they're putting the community first and that they're willing to protect those things that are valuable to us, which is the most valuable to me is my kids, uh, and, and prioritize that. And then if you're going to locate, and I understand the current mayor uh, wants to engage in a satellite program, you know, and there's probably some merit to that, but how do you protect the neighborhood? How do you engage the neighborhood so that the neighborhood is a partner with you as opposed to being another victim of the process? And, uh, you know, you just saw what happened in Chief Gary neighborhood when uh, they were trying to relocate the cat. Um, you know, the neighborhood was up in arms. And uh, then just, I think just yesterday, the uh, mayor and the uh, city finally said, okay, we're gonna stop. We're gonna, we're gonna maybe try this a different way. And, uh, I think a different way is it has the opportunity for success, but it really depends upon how you're going to do it. It's going to be easier to locate these facilities if you can do one and demonstrate that it can be done safely and um, that there are provisions to be able to protect the neighborhood. We do not want to make the neighborhoods the victims of this process. And I think there's a way to get there. 
sticking with housing, um, you know, folks end up experiencing homelessness in a variety of ways. Uh, one thing that is pointed to in our region is kind of the shortage of housing stock. Um, and I know development has your record of bringing in businesses and new developments is something you've touted in past elections. Um, is there anything more that the county can be doing there to kind of increase those pathways to home ownership? There is, and I really appreciate the fact that uh, I have the opportunity to talk about this. But, you know, the other element, and this was said last night at the uh, uh, Spokane Business Association uh, dinner. Uh, if you want to get somebody out of homelessness, you have to have a job. And if you don't have a job, it doesn't matter how many services you provide for them. Um, they're still not going to be financially independent. They still are not going to have that that freedoms that come with uh, financial security. And so one of my big priorities, and I'm not a ba uh, ashamed about this at all, in fact, I'm very proud of it, is uh, my ability to attract new businesses and new industries to this community. Um, I mean, uh, many of uh, my supporters and, and other community leaders have said, you know, you have been more successful at bringing new jobs to this community than other organizations that were designed to do that and still haven't. So I'd rather give somebody a paycheck than a welfare check. And the only way you do that is with a new job. With regard to housing, uh, you know, in my real life, I'm an architect and, and uh, the state of Washington is, um, has created a very hostile work environment, a hostile environment with regard to low income housing. Uh, you know, even though the Growth Management Act uh, says that you're, one of your uh, goals is to provide affordable housing, uh, it's a challenge across the state. And part of it's because the legislature keeps on layering on additional financial burdens for housing. Uh, impact fees, for instance. I uh, was at a speaking engagement with Lieutenant Governor Denny Heck just a couple of weeks ago, and he and I are Interestingly enough, he's a, a Democrat, I'm a Republican, but both of us are united. We both uh, are, are fighting to get affordable housing in the state of Washington. And, uh, and he was saying, you know, he's got a community on the other side of the state whose impact fees are $85,000 for a single family home. You know, the, the recent building code uh, adoption added another 30,000. Uh, in the city of Spokane, they have uh, uh, hookup fees and impact fees and stuff. And every time you raise the cost of housing, you have eliminated tens of thousands of people from getting into their first home. So one of the things that we've done at the county, and I'm in the process of doing it again with the uh, um, Garden Springs area and, and uh, uh, the Geiger exit uh, area is um, we've used a tool called uh, tax increment financing that helps reduce that cost for that entry level homes uh, so that it makes it more affordable for folks in um, both, you know, not only communities of color and BIPOC, but low income. And from my standpoint, as a, a Marine Corps veteran, I'm really concerned about making sure that we can provide affordable housing for the uh, enlisted men and women out at Fairchild Air Force Base. Uh, I attended uh, Kathy McMorris Rogers uh, Military Family uh, uh, Symposium out there, and, and one of the things that they stressed was, you know, we need to provide opportunities for folks to get into home ownership. Uh, and it, that's, this is across the board, whether it's uh, BIPOC communities or, or, or military. You know, home ownership is the pathway to generate generational wealth, and we so I've been pushing that. We've we've got a project up in the north area, north end of Spokane, that is using uh, TIF uh, tax increment financing uh, to do a 1,500 home development uh, up there, and part of that will be entry level homes. Uh, working with a major developer at the Garden Springs, and he's committed to 25 percent of the homes that he builds will be for low income and entry level. So those are tools that we have that we can implement to be able to make affordable housing realistic again. Otherwise, everybody's gonna to continue to move over to Post Falls. You know, the state of Washington is projecting for the Spokane County in the next 20 years, we're gonna see an additional 100,000 residents coming to Spokane. How are you gonna accommodate that? How do you plan for that? 
Um, you know, I got the experience. You know, I started out as a um, planning commission for the city of Spokane, then went to city council, and now with the county. I'm the only one that's got the experience necessary to get us through this process and do it successfully. I mean, um, uh, Smart Growth USA, which is the only national uh, organization that uh, does analysis on uh, planning structures for different communities, whether the cities or counties across the nation. In their last report, they listed Spokane County in the top 10 percent, top 10 percent nationally for utilizing smart growth strategies. I'm really proud of that because that means we're getting it right. And we're getting it right more than 90 percent of the other counties in the country. So um, I want to take that experience and continue to uh, work on how do we plan for the next 20 years and how do we make sure that we've got housing that's affordable for everybody. And I've been a big proponent for condominium uh, development. Uh, testified over at the state uh, for uh, getting that tool back on the, the books for the state of Washington. You know, when you live in a 300 unit apartment building, you're paying the landlord's mortgage. But if that 300 unit was a condo, you're paying your mortgage. You never have to worry about a rent increase. Uh, that is an equitable and uh, a realistic pathway to get into home ownership. Uh, the state, unfortunately, uh, ever since the uh, meltdown in 2009 and their elimination of condo developments in the state of Washington uh, is just now inching back into the condo market. Well, they need to be much more aggressive because we've got folks that are paying rent that should be paying a mortgage. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Your, um, your district, you know, development is, it's, it's visible. You know, you drive down the highway and you can see the houses going up mm -hmm. and you can see the new businesses. Um, your opponent, Molly Marshall, um, has said that that development is not occurring responsibly um, and that there's not the necessary infrastructure in place for stuff like water, sewer, or emergency services like the uh, in case of a wildfire or a fire response. Uh, how would you respond to that? She's just uninformed. Um, you know, a lot of the things that she complains about are things inside the city of Spokane. And I don't, I'm not on the city council. If she wants to control the things like in Leita Valley, run for city council because the city controls the development inside Leita Valley. Uh, but when you look on the West Plains, you know, we do have sewer, we do have water, we've got fire protection. Uh, uh, I think in, uh, it's either next week or the week after next, we're uh, going to do the groundbreaking on uh, uh, a regional park in the West Terrace neighborhood. Uh, and so, and we've got good public transportation and a variety of other in, um, amenities and stuff. So, um, you know, she's, she, she takes the failures of the city with regard to Leita Valley, and I live in Leita Valley, and tries to make them a county property uh, problem. Well, again, going back to Smart Growth USA, they who are experts in the area of growth and growth management it's Spokane County in the top 10 percent. So um, she's just factually inaccurate, just not uh, knowledgeable, just lacks the knowledge to know how to, how, how to grow a community. We actually have more flexibility in the county code when it comes to housing and other development opportunities than the city of Spokane does. And some of the stuff that you can only do by special permit in the city of Spokane, we do as, as, as routinely. A great example is Kendall Yards. Uh, Kendall Yards had to have a special permit to be able to do that project. In Spokane County, he could, have, he could have done that same project without any kind of special permits because we allow for flexibility. We allow for opportunities for creative ways to provide housing and economic development. And as far as um, Kendall Yards, that kind of development, you're talking about mixed use with- Mixed the, use, okay. yep, yep. Mixed use in a variety of different housing types, zero lot line developments, small lot developments, uh, uh, townhouse developments. I mean, a lot of those tools we allow developers to use routinely because it gets better use of the property and you're not consuming. You know, one of the goals of the Growth Management Act is uh, don't consume agricultural land for development. Uh, and so we, we really try and preserve our agricultural land. And, I'm very proud of the fact that, you know, I've got a strong 
uh, support and a great working relationship with our ag community, whether it's, you know, the ags or whether it's uh, cattle ranchers or farmers or, you know, Highline Grain is one of the largest uh, grain ha handling operations in eastern Washington, and they've endorsed my race because I understand the, the line between uh, protecting our ag community and our ag, ag, quite frankly, in Spokane County is one of our largest exports. And so it's not just, well, they're growing wheat out there. No, they're feeding the world. And so uh, protecting that is critical. But, and just, uh, just last weekend, I was part of a town hall meeting where we were talking about um, uh, um, wind turbines and um, you know, the development of uh, uh, alternative energy here in Spokane County. Uh, and so just introducing the topic to folks and saying this is a public process. We need the farming community and the ag community to tell us where is the medium, where is uh, the sweet spot for being able to deal with uh, uh, alternative energy and protecting our la ag land and stuff. So this is a process we'll, uh, we're not rushing, we're taking our time with, but then you've got solar panels and then you, I'm working with the company out of uh, uh, Arizona right now that uh, specializes in uh, uh, building um, hydrogen fuel cell manufacturing facilities. We will need to, and we will lead with my, my leadership, uh, Eastern Washington when we deal with not only renewable energy, but um, a hydrogen fuel cell, which will be the fuel that will not only uh, fuel our uh, semi trucks and, and commerce, but also our ag community. Uh, you're not going to put a big, huge plow, uh, a, a battery on the back of a plow and expect it to go plow a field. Uh, it just, the, one, there's not that kind of equipment, but two, uh, the battery would be worse, uh, bigger than the, uh, than the plow itself. But, so, but hydrogen fuel is the fuel for the future. And uh, being able to generate that and distribute it here locally is you know, part of that clean energy initiative. Uh, also working with the solar panel farm uh, to uh, uh, locate a large uh, solar uh, farm here. So uh, you gotta be on the leading edge. You gotta be thinking about not only today, but tomorrow, what do we do five years, 10 years, 20 years? And that's what I do. I'm glad you touched on the renewable energy because um, we'd covered that recently, that legislation that's impending. I had hoped to ask you about that. Um, I got one more development question for you. Um, you know, your district includes some remote pockets that are susceptible to wildfire. Uh, they're considered at risk out there. Uh, when you think of Medical Lake, I know a lot of folks there are having difficulties with their home insurance. And I'm wondering if there's anything the county can do uh, to kind of aid uh, those homeowners, either from future fire danger or uh, in securing that insurance. So the, uh, the insurance uh, issue is something that's controlled at the state, not at the county level. But one of the things that we have been uh, advocating for, and uh, we've not reduced it to an ordinance because I, I, I want to be very respectful of property rights and, and uh, the opportunity of people to, to uh, build the home that they want. But we have been encouraging folks to uh, use uh, non-combustible materials uh, in the construction. There are now uh, materials that look like uh, shake roofs, but they're actually uh, non-combustible. Uh, you can put um, um, hardy board or hardy plank on the side of your house. It's a, basically a cement product, um, uh, a cement fiber product that uh, is non-combustible and stuff. And so there are uh, building materials and, you know, quite frankly, I think for if you're going to be in a rural area, uh, you might even consider putting a sprinkler system on, on your roof. Uh, uh, because it's the small embers that will start a big fire. And um, uh, so we are trying to uh, educate uh, homeowners about here's how you can make your home uh, uh, fire resistant. And that will, uh, um, the insurance companies respect the fact that if it's non-combustible, then uh, there's not the kind of risk that there would be if you had a wood shake roof, for instance, that is highly combustible and stuff. And I think there's a heightened level of awareness about that safety zone. Uh, not only the safety zone around your home, but also uh, getting rid of fuel inside 
uh, the un, um, the rural areas and stuff. And so I know even in my my own uh, neighborhood, uh, we just had a contractor come by and 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 clean out in our common areas a lot of fuel that otherwise would be uh, fodder for uh, a fire. So I think we're our our overall level of awareness is is heightened. The other thing is that uh, you know uh, for a long time we've. Um, said that uh, a developer that's developing a residential neighborhood, um, he can develop up to 20 homes on a road um, without having to provide uh, access to it and stuff. And I think we're going to end up having to come back and readdress that and make sure that, you know, there is not only a way out uh, if the fire is at the beginning of the road instead of the end of the road, but the other way, uh, the other thing is making sure that our heightened level of fire protection is there. You know, it's a balance. You know, uh, the county can't dictate to the fire districts what the fire districts would do. We have, I think it's 14 or 15 fire districts that are all controlled by independently elected fire district commissioners. And I'm very proud of the fact that I've got many of those fire district commissioners that have endorsed my race. Um, you know, I'm, I've actually been through firefighting training. I'm, I'm a, a certified trainer from FEMA um, uh, for community emergency response. I've also been through the Citizens Police Academy and a Marine Corps veteran. I mean, I, I don't just talk about public safety. I walk the walk and have been in that situation and stuff and understand what our frontline responders are having to deal with. And, uh, and I need to be able to make sure that they have the resources to keep themselves safe and keep our community safe. Thank you. Um, the contaminated waters on the west plains is mm -hmm. you know one of the banner issues for the district this election um you know you and your opponent have each released plans on how to address uh the contamination and there's been a lot of questions raised about you in particular as a member of the airport board uh, the s3r3 board and the commissioner for that district um you know some have even alleged you've orchestrated a cover-up of the 2017 test that discovered the contamination on airport grounds um, so I wanted to ask what you would say to voters who still have those concerns uh, or who may feel you weren't transparent or as forthcoming as you should have been. Go to my county webpage, and uh, I have a summary of my activities for the last seven years and um, uh, how I've responded to different issues uh, and uh, uh, did that uh, through that whole process. Um, with uh, legal counsel to make sure that I was complying with every uh, element of the law, which I'm required to do by statute, but also that um, um, I was doing everything I could to uh, move the response for the region forward. Um, you know, there. When I started this race back in the spring um, and then knew who my opponent was going to be, I knew that uh, this was not going to be a race about issues. This was going to be a race about accusations, slander, uh, mistruths, half-truths, uh, because she has no record to run on. She has no civic record to run on compared to mine. And so um, that continues to be a challenge. Uh, quite frankly, uh, there are folks that will say whatever they want to say, uh, regardless of what the facts are. Uh, but the facts are, on uh, November 22nd of 2017, we responded to a public records request and made the testing on uh, Spokane International Airport public. Um, there were a lot of elements that people uh, went to rush to judgment on without having the facts. Um, I need to rely on the facts, and uh, and we're still trying to discover what those are. It's interesting when they talk about the cover-up. There's absolutely no evidence of any cover-up because there never was a cover-up. What was interesting is Commissioner Mary Cooney was looking at the grant opportunity from ecology at the same time I was, and I was unaware of it. Uh, and it come to the same conclusion I came to that the county should not pursue that grant because ecology 
is the regulatory agency. Spokane County is not. We're, we're a service entity. We're not a regulatory agency. Ecology was trying to get us to do their work. They should have done the job. They should have done the job three years prior that they're doing now. And they fully were capable of doing it three years prior as opposed to doing it now. And so, um, and because the county owns half of the airport, if we did a report and did the study and came out and said, hey, guess what? There's no PFAS from the airport. Do you think anybody would believe it? Absolutely not, because we have a conflict of interest. We are part owner of the airport, just like the city of Spokane is. It's interesting, and that's why I say this is all political. There are three other elected officials on the airport board that had the same information I had, exactly the same information I had, and have said nothing. I've been out in the community, and I have said something. And not only that, I've worked to try and solve the problem. I've got a, a solution to bring good, clean, new water to the West Plains. Uh, I now have the Kalispell tribe that have said, we're ready to move forward. I have a major property owner in northern Idaho uh, and the Colon uh, Coeur d'Alene River that says, and it's got significant water rights, is that I'm willing to partner with you to move forward to develop the trust agreement. So we have an attorney in Seattle that is working on that trust agreement right now. And the minute that we can get the ecology to agree to the trust agreement, then we can get a drill a permit to drill the well, and we can start construction on bringing new clean water to the West Plains. That's real. Um, uh, uh, the Air Force already has four wells uh, down by the river, already has a major water line that comes up and feeds the base. We will be located right next to it. I don't have to worry about acquiring easements or right-of-ways or anything. All of that's already in place. All I need is that permit to drill that well, and we're off to the races. The other thing we're doing, and uh, there'll be a public uh, a, a press release out on that uh, either today or Monday, uh, where we've uh, asked for residents that want to be part of a grant application to the state legislature for uh, installing filtration systems on their wells. Uh, we've already got a pretty good list, but we're doing one more ask so that we can quantify it uh, then put a cost to it and then put the grant in. I've already been uh, working with their legislators at the state level in anticipation of this coming toward them. Um, but it's not only replacing or put, installing the new equipment, which is very expensive. I mean, uh, we're, we're getting forty to $50,000 cost per well, but then replacing the filters can also be expensive. So we're asking for the cost for the well uh, filtration system and filters for five years. And that will be part of our ask to the legislature. Um, it's also gonna be part of our ask to the federal government. I mean, uh, whether it's Fairchild or whether it's SIA or a number of other sources, this was not created by the community. This was created by agencies at the federal level that um, uh, said, you will use this foam. You will use this product. And so if they're making the decision that we have to use it, they ought to be held accountable for uh, correcting the, the problem. And now, this is the, just to clarify, that's the firefighting foam. Firefighting foam. That, that contains PFAS. PFAS. Okay. You know, but I mean, you know, PFAS is, was discovered in, or created actually in 1938. It's been in our system for oh, almost 90 years now. Um, but it is in everything. It is absolutely in everything. I. I was at a Cattlemen's Association meeting here uh, last month, and uh, one of the folks there at the, uh, the meeting was saying, yeah, I've got a brother out in Green Acres, and, and he discovered PFAS in his water in his well. I'm going, out in Green Acres, how is that possible? And he said, yeah, none of his property owners around him had PFAS in their wells. I said, what did he do? And he said he pulled, had a drilling, uh, drill uh, company pull the casing out of his well and at every 10-foot joint, there was a Teflon tape caulking that has PFAS in it. And so they removed the tape, put a different caulking compound on every joint, put the same casing back into the well, and he doesn't test positive now for PFAS. It was in the tape. How many other wells were done at the same time his was that used the same tape that now have PFAS in it? don't know but it's a question we need to start asking is you know how, how prevalent is this 
uh, I shared with uh, Dr. Chad Pritchard that story, and he said, Al, it's even worse than that. We have uh, equipment that says it filters PFAS out of the water, but then when you break the equipment down, it has PFAS in its sealants, caulks, and gaskets. And he said, you, 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 you're, you're installing equipment to get rid of a chemical that has the chemical in the equipment. So that becomes you know, another challenge in terms of making sure that you're installing the right equipment that doesn't have PFAS in it. But PFAS is in every, but if you've got a heart a pace, pacemaker, you probably have PFAS in the pacemaker. If you've got contacts, you probably have PFAS in your contacts. I mean, it's just, it's everywhere. And uh, so now we have to deal with it. And those in, on the West Plains aren't the only community grappling with a contamination like that right now. It's it's nationwide. Well, actually, it's inter it's international. I mean, there, uh, you know, it's interesting though. At the June third uh, uh, West Plains Water Coalition meeting, a, a gentleman asked the ecology, said, uh, "How long have you known about PFAS presence on the West Plains?" And uh, she responded, "Oh, we've known it's on on the West Plains for 20 years. That goes back to 20 or 2004, not 2017, 2004." They've known about PFAS on the West Plains and did nothing, and did nothing. So, uh, and the other thing is, you know, EPA on uh, April 19th um, uh, created the four parts per trillion as the threshold for, for um, uh, health. And so another individual asked, uh, well, how did you come to the conclusion that four parts per trillion was the health risk? The response from ecology was, that's the lowest level we could test to. He said, that's not the question. How do, you, how do you know that that's the health risk? She said, we don't. We just know that that's the lowest level we can test to. In Europe, the threshold is 200 parts per trillion. In Canada, it's 20, or 70 parts per trillion. Australia, it's 75 parts per trillion. We are the lowest threshold for health issue in the world. Uh, is it the right one? We don't know, and neither do the experts. Ecology is saying we don't know just how low we can test. So there's there's a lot of research, there's a lot of information that we don't know, and we're working to try and get the answers. But I'm on I'm on them on the phone or in contact with the federal delegation, probably every couple of weeks, uh, working with uh, folks in the community as well as in the industry about you know how do we how do we um, how do we try and mitigate this impact? How do we get to clean water? So far, my, my plan, I know that my opponent has presented a five-point plan that, um, you know, one of the points we're not even eligible for, and she still promotes it, um, the litigation the city of Spokane entered into, adjoined, is only eligible for water purveyors. Spokane County is not a water purveyor, uh, so we're not even eligible to join the litigation, but she continues to promote it. Uh, hiring a toxicologist. We don't need a toxicologist. We can already use the one from the state. Uh, the other three pro items we've already been doing. Uh, so there's nothing new about the plan. But the bottom line is, even if you do all five of them, you still end up with uh, contaminated water. The, the plan doesn't address how do you bring clean water to the West Plains. And so far, my plan is the only one. Now there is, through the state health department, there is a grant program that's available uh, for um, under sink filtration. Uh, so you can get a, a filtration unit that goes underneath your sink and uh, will provide you at least clean water at the faucet. Um, but for a lot of the folks in the West Plains, that doesn't help them water their cattle or water the garden or water their irrigate their fields. Uh, they need to have another source of water and that's what I'm trying to bring for them. Well, I appreciate you touching on that. Um... I know it's a complicated issue, but it's one folks are concerned about right now. Um, is there anything else we haven't touched on today that you wanted to share with voters before we wrap up? Um, you know, it's interesting when, uh, that uh, uh, when we talk about economic development, uh, there is actually a state statute that requires the county commissioners be responsible for the economic health of their community. One of the things that I learned when I was at the city of Spokane was, uh, you know, the balance that you need to attain between 
business development and commercial develop or residential development. When you look at um, taxes that are uh, acquired by a, an entity uh, like a city or the county, um, taxes that we get from business community, uh, about 65 percent. Uh, well, for every dollar that we get, 65 cents for the dollar is used to provide services because businesses don't really require a lot. The mm -hmm. police, fire, uh, that's pretty much it. Roads, and that's it. Residential communities require a lot more. They require parks, they require schools, they require uh, a lot of other elements that make the neighborhood. And so for every dollar you get, it costs a dollar thirty-five to provide services. And so the trick is getting the balance so that you make sure that you've got enough business to support the services that you're providing to the residential community. If you don't have that business development, your residential community is gonna to have to pay more in taxes. Uh, and so you've gotta have that balance. And you also have to have that balance to make sure that you have housing for the workforce to drive business. You know, on May 22nd, my opponent in a town hall meeting uh, suggested and campaigned for uh, a 10-year moratorium on the West Plains to stop all development. All development, no housing, no commercial, no industrial, uh, and you, you just, moratoriums are not a solution. Moratoriums are a pause, and uh, that pause is to find the solution, but ultimately you still have to find a solution, and that's what I've done historically, that's what I continue to do today. You know, as an architect, that's what we're trained to do is find solutions, whether it's a design solution or a community solution. And that's what I got a track record of doing. And I'd like to be able to continue to do that for this community for the next uh, four years. Um, when I talked about Denny Heck and the, um, uh, him, uh, he and I sharing the, the podium for um, uh, groundbreaking, that groundbreaking was for Collins Aerospace. They're doing a $200 million expansion on their facility out in the West Plains. I've been working with them since January this year to try and make sure that that expansion happened here and not at some other facility. Um, Collins Aerospace now is bigger in the aerospace sector than Boeing is, than Boeing and they're gonna put almost a quarter of a billion dollars here in Spokane. Next week, we should be approving a sale to a company uh, from the Midwest that's going to bring three manufacturing operations to the West Plains uh, and several hundred jobs. Uh, and so I've been working with them for about a year and a half to try and make sure that they located here in Spokane and not in the I-5 corridor where they were originally looking at. And then when I found out about it, I reached out to him and I said, you know what, we can, we can meet your needs over here in Spokane. Well, that's 300 jobs that are gonna be here. That means 300 people are gonna have access to economic freedom. And so that's, that's the win for me, is knowing that somebody has got a paycheck and an opportunity to become financially independent. Um, that only comes from a job, and that's what I—that's what I work real hard uh, to uh, to be able to do. And so, um, no, I think I'm good. Well, thank you for being here today. Do you have any you. Uh, final thoughts? An elevator pitch that you wanted to share? Well, my t my top three priorities uh, that I share with folks is public safety. Public safety. I want to protect you. I want to protect your family. I want to protect your property, and I want to protect your pocketbook. Uh, so. Uh, being endorsed by Sheriff Knowles and Sheriff Knezovich and um, uh, Sheriff deputies from across the county, that's a big deal for me because it means that I'm doing things right and uh, I'm working in partnership with them to keep our community safe. And public safety right now is number one. I don't care whether you're in the West Plains, you're in Indian Trail or down in the Latov Valley, everybody is concerned about keeping them and their families safe. Uh, and so, and taxes, taxes are just, just draining people dry. I mean, people's credit cards are maxed out and they're living paycheck to paycheck and the last thing they can afford is um, an increase in taxes. And so uh, that's why, you know, I've committed, pledged to 
hold me accountable. It's in all my written documents uh, that I do not plan on raising property taxes next year. Uh, our citizens deserve a break and they'll get it from me. And then third is jobs. Uh, like I said earlier, I'd rather give somebody a paycheck than a welfare check, but that requires a job. And um, that's what I'm focused on bringing to the community is good paying jobs. And uh, then that allows you to get into a home that uh, you own and build equity and generational wealth. So they all tie together and it's a package. And um, I don't just talk about it. I've got a track record to doing it. You know, it's just, just it's, it's always entertaining. Candidates apply for a job and try and convince the public that if you elect them, they can do things they've never done before in their life. I think that's one of the biggest lies you can say to the public. Never done it before, but if you elect me, I can do it. No, you can't. Uh, you've got no track record of proving it. Um, for me, experience matters. I've got a track record, and uh, I don't say that I can do something that I know I can't. Uh, I deliver on all my promises, and, uh, and it's been a real honor, been a real honor to serve this community. Um, and I, I, I hope I get the opportunity to do it for another four years. Well, Commissioner French, thank you uh, for your time this morning, and uh, voters can look forward to the November election. Thank you.